this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we are getting you set for college football week number 11 by talking to Ben Brown of Pro Football Focus, getting his thoughts on this week's biggest games, the Heisman market, and much more. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here, as always, by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. And Ed, I am... Rocking the Northwestern pullover yeah. for today because my mom was talking trash about Northwestern, talking about, hey, I should wear the 12 with Iowa, right? And hey, they covered. That's all that matters. So I had to wear the, the Northwestern gear today to celebrate the big victory in not losing by more than 12 for Northwestern. Yeah, wasn't Iowa up 14 nothing in the first half? I mean, they were up the whole game. Um, it was... Well, it yeah, was... they were up the whole game, but I think they only got a field goal the second half. So. Yeah, and like... Honestly, it kind of goes back to what you were talking about a couple weeks ago where, you know, you want to regress towards, you know, program, program baselines of Northwestern's defense. They've suddenly remembered how to tackle, which has been That's encouraging. Helpful. Yeah, it's good to tackle. Uh, hot take. tackle. Yeah. Um, like, it wasn't a pretty game, but like, you know, I got to take when they're three and six, you got to take what you can get. The, the covering is enough for me to be happy. <laughs> how are you doing this week? i'm doing pretty good uh it was it was uh it was i got distracted from michigan at michigan against indiana and uh watched lsu almost pull off a big upset at alabama but it was um it was just kind of sad watching that lsu team yeah really couldn't do anything against an alabama defense that's not really what they've been in the past and so it was just kind of sad it was sad there but it was also I would say the word is frustrating to watch Alabama's offense because like, I don't know what, like they they've had like this, basically every offensive line in the NFL is an Alabama person, but like for whatever reason, they just couldn't do anything there. So you've got LSU where like, you know, there's the frustration you were talking or like the, you know, kind of sadness, but then Alabama was also frustrating. So like, it wasn't, even though it was like a good game, it wasn't an enjoyable game. Am right. I like, I, I, that's, that's the impression that I got there at least. Yeah. I think Alabama's offense is going to be fine. Yeah. I'm not too like, worried about it. I, I wouldn't worry too much either, but just like that game individually I'm, really weird. It was, I already am looking forward to a neutral site game against Georgia in the sec championship game. That is going to be a good one. I, I don't think I, Georgia's I'm looking defense is faced. Yeah. I don't think Georgia's defense has faced anything like what they're going to see in that game. So um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, should be a fun one for sure. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit about Alabama, talking about the Heisman and more with Ben Brown. You can find him on Twitter at PFF underscore Ben Brown. He is on the PFF betting podcast. You can find his work over at PFF as well. We're going to break down his college football betting process because this is the first time we've had Ben on. So uh, good to dig in there and talk about his favorite bets for week number 11 across college football. Also, we have our NFL podcast coming up later on today, talking to my colleague, my other co-host, Brandon Gadula, getting his thoughts on week number 10 in the NFL, talking some player props there with regards to simulations, his process there, and getting his thoughts on week 10. To get that and to get every episode of Covering the Spread, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We are at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, you name it, you can find us there. Uh, while you're there, make sure you hit subscribe and also leave us a rating and review because that does help us out a bunch. Before we get to Ben, though, got to go back to last week and go through a nice week for our, our guest, Ben Stevens. Covering the past. You can find Ben Stevens on Twitter at Ben Scott Stevens. Make sure you check him out on Sports Grid and the morning after as well. And like I said, Ben did pretty well last week. He was on the under for Auburn versus Texas A&M at 49 and a half. And it closed at 50. Didn't. It barely got halfway there. Yeah. <laughs> it was a 20 to three game. Bo Nix kind of re-became Bo Nix. Auburn put up just three <laughs> points. Texas a and uh, scored 20. So an easy hit there for Ben. And Ed, I always remember, you know, I think back to like, think think of Rob Pozzola's tweets about how like unders give you like bad hearts, basically, because you're just constantly sweating. You never know if if it's, uh, it's going to win. This is yeah. one of those unders where you didn't have to sweat it too much, which was nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was crazy i mean what was it 20 to 3 right yeah yeah didn't sweat that one that much 
Not I even mean, half. especially when the spread is, you know, when the margin's pretty big into the fourth quarter and you're trying to run out the clock. Right. It's a good thing. And it's important to keep in mind with overs, too, is you kind of want that competitive game to keep both sides pushing the whole way. Ben was on the under for Washington's team total against Oregon. That was a 20 and a half. Washington did come kind of close, I guess, because they scored 16. But it's an under regardless. But like 16 points might have been generous for how they played. Uh, They had seven first downs. They had 166 total yards. They fired a bunch of dudes, which is generally not a good sign after that. So it looked close on paper to get 16, given the total was in the low 20s. But Ben got that one. Analysis was spot on. I feel like it was actually even less close than it looked uh, for that one, too. So a nice uh, hit there for Ben as well. Ben's final bet was on the Wake Forest money line at plus 114 against UNC. It closed right around there, and it looked good for a long time. Uh, Wake was up 48 to 34 to start the uh, at the start of the fourth quarter, but then USC's off or UNC's offense went just bananas. Uh, they were aided by some shorter fields for sure. UNC won at 58 to 55. So a two and one week for Ben, uh, despite the loss there on the Wake Forest money line. Ed, did you get to watch that UNC Wake game? Because I was kind of half fall i was at the grocery store for part of it but like it was a fun game to follow i i only saw about the last last couple minutes of the game yeah. i did see bill Connolly tweet something about well if wake force was gonna lose this was gonna be because of their defense and they're 103rd in my adjusted success rate that's bad and that's bad for a power five team and that you know you've you've uh you've managed to i guess they got to eight no with a, a really terrible defense i mean they gave up what 60 points to army or whatever it was Mm -hmm. so well yeah we'll see we'll see what happens going forward it helps me when you can put up 72 but that's not always going to be the case and it might be the case this week because we'll talk about that uh their game with nc state with ben in just a bit so ben stevens goes two and one uh some high uh high standards there for ben brown for this week yours ed was on Purdue plus three against Michigan State, and that did one. That one did come off a key number. Uh, it closed at two and a half, so a, an impactful move for you there. And Purdue played great. They got a lead in the first half. They were able to build on it in the second half. They didn't just like cover this one. I think that they outplayed them by a decent amount as well. So a nice win for you there. Any final thoughts for you on uh, the Purdue win for you? Believe in success rate. Uh... <laughs> This is what Connolly's been telling me for years. I'm leaning more into it than ever this year. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's a good thing. No, that yep. is a good thing. Absolutely. And uh, a nice one there for sure. So you get the win there. One in a week for you and a two in one week for Ben Stevens. And again, uh, we'll see if Ben Brown can follow that up again. You can follow Ben on Twitter at PFF underscore Ben Brown and check out the PFF betting podcast. We'll get to Ben in just one second. But first, FanDuel is giving you the chance to bet on week 10 of the NFL with a risk-free same game parlay. All you got to do is go to sportsbook.fanduel.com or download the FanDuel Sportsbook app, place a three plus leg same game parlay on any Week 10 NFL game. If your bet loses, get a refund inside credit. Max refund is $10. Bet on Week 10 of the NFL with FanDuel by heading over to the FanDuel Sportsbook today, placing a risk-free NFL same-game parlay. Must be 21-plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Connecticut, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Excited to add New York to this list coming up uh, in January as well. Refund issued as a non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $10. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Same game parlay available for multiple sports in all states on mobile and web. Gambling problem? Call 100Gambler. Visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Connecticut, 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.NET, or in Arizona, call 100-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342. Covering the present. Let's bring Ben Brown into covering the spread to talk week 11 across college football and his overall college betting process. Ben, it is a pleasure to have you on the show today. How are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing really well, guys. I appreciate you both having me on. Like I said, you know, off air. I definitely enjoy listening to covering the spread every single week. So it's uh, definitely a pleasure to be on chatting it up with you. 
I like see the numbers. I know people listen to it, but it's always weird to me. People say they listen to it. Like it's always kind of like a shock to me. So I'll definitely take that for sure. Uh, And it's, I'm glad that you're a listener. We appreciate that for sure. I want to ask you before we dive in though, how are things going for you this year? Because we're into November. We are well into both NFL and college season. How are things going for you so far? Yeah, they have gone uh, fairly well. Definitely better from an NFL perspective. For the most part, I have been, uh, you know, trying to deviate a little bit from just betting, you know, the typical game spreads and totals. So I have found myself in a lot of these ulterior markets. I have been heavily involved in player props previously, just starting to get rolling on some like college level player props. But I found a lot of it to be really interesting, especially from a model perspective. So it has been going uh, fairly well for me so far to start 2021. Now, do you have your own player prop models? You mentioned, are you leaning on the PFS stuff for that? Or where are, what are you using for as far as modeling goes? Yeah, so we uh, we do have, you know, the player props tool from PFF.com. I also have uh, kind of a similar setup structure for college football um, that I use quite a bit. Uh, you know, just getting involved with some of those markets. It is very similar model-based approach um, to what we use for our projections on our player props tool. Um, a lot of the same inputs and stuff like that. We do use a lot of like the PFF uh, grades and other facet things um, to kind of build out those models, but it's all done uh, kind of on this top down approach, right? We're looking at uh, the game spread and total modeling that initially, and then kind of seeing how we expect the game narrative to kind of play out based on how we see that overall picture. So I like that approach quite a bit. I know a lot of people have other, you know, ideas and ways that they model things, but I think that's, you know, definitely the beauty of sports betting in general. But that top-down stuff impacts everything. So I think that if you're going to be modeling it out, you kind of have to do it that way. Obviously, like, if one thing goes one way, it does kind of, you know, alter a lot of stuff, and that could lead you down a wrong path. But I think you kind of have to have that baseline because right. like you're going to project things very differently for a game with a 52 point total versus, you know, the Monday night game, the 39 and a half point right. total, like that's going to alter things a lot. So I think that it's net, it, it, people may disagree, but it is necessary if you right. want to have an, an overall view of these. Things. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I've tried a number of different approaches. That is definitely the best one that I've stumbled on. Uh, and it does help you uh, kind of build, you know, your whole, your whole portfolio, portfolio for how you kind of see that game playing out i do think that is the approach that bookmakers use as well uh just in the way that they release you know spreads and totals for the game and then some other things start to kind of trickle in throughout the week so um but i do think you know targeting those spots in those ulterior markets are the best way to be profitable right now i know they used to kind of get a bad rap for being you know uh, you couldn't get as much volume down in some of those markets things like that but i think that's kind of uh, toward the wayside, if you spread out your action, I do think that you can get uh, more than enough to make you feel comfortable uh, on any one of those kind of types of bets throughout the week, basically. Excellent. Yeah. So, so Ben, we uh, we asked you on to talk about college football and uh, would love to know more about your process. What kind of things are you looking at? What data sources are you using? Uh, g- give us a general idea about that. Yeah, definitely. So we definitely, you know, incorporate PFF, you know, grades at the facet level. And then we do try and do some adjustment for things like injuries and stuff like that. Obviously, quarterback position heavily influence, uh, you know, our our overall projections. But there are some things, uh, you know, with injury situations and how that can impact, you know, like the pass route grade that a team is going to have from PFF's perspective. So we do fold all that in. We, of course, fold in some of the things, you know, like rest differentials. Um, some nuances for like conference strength and things like that, especially with like the SEC uh, at the college football level. So that's all included in our models. Then we do some, you know, other things. We do regress to the market, but we don't really use that in any sort of like baseline spot until we're, you know, already built our numbers for that particular game. So um, I do think, you know, it's worked out well. Our What we would call like PFF Greenline has been up for both the NFL and college football in the 2021 season so far. Uh, If you're betting, you know, with the Kelly criteria, uh, it has been up significantly more than flat staking. But I do think um, it has shown, especially this season, to be, you know, a profitable betting tool if people are interested uh, in, you know, using that approach. And I do think using a model is going to be the best way to have success in sports betting. And I've I've read mostly about this with regards to, like, outrights for golf regressing towards the market um is that are you applying in the same way where like i think that i think it was data golf wrote about how like if you do you know simulated win odds and then 
put that in as X percent. And then what the market says is Y percent. Is that kind of the way you're doing things here in terms of like factoring in the market? Yeah, definitely. And that that is basically kind of how we are handling it. And then it also helps us if we are um, wrong about the market, but it also moves away from us. Then we are kind of regressing in a more heavy fashion based on that calculation because we do, you know, we do respect the market. We do respect uh, the market movement and using that information to kind of sharpen our models is just something that you you almost have to do to kind of be successful and stay ahead of the market, right? So I think it's just, you know, an additional factor folded into our model that definitely helps the overall prediction process. For sure. So Ben, let's uh, talk about college football in general and uh, the Heisman voting, uh, Heisman winner, something you can bet on. Uh, Bryce Love uh, is looking at the favorite at plus uh, 170, uh, but there's there's a couple guys at plus 700. Uh, is there any, are you seeing any value in this market? Yeah, I see a really little bit. Um, I think after Michigan State's loss to Purdue, I don't really think Walker is playable, especially at the third shortest odds. Um, it just seems like a really far stretch t- for him uh, to even make uh, the four finalists. If, you know, if the Spartans don't play in that Big Ten title game, I don't expect them to pull off the upset against Iowa State. Ohio State next week. So I think they will probably be, um, you know, close to two touchdown underdogs and their style of play just doesn't really seem to, you know, gravitate toward that big sort of upset outlook. So I think he's probably going to fade off a little bit. And I do think that probably opens up value uh, for that next tier below him. Matt Carell, I think depends heavily on their matchup this weekend against Texas A&M. They are two and a half point dogs. He obviously got banged up in their, you know, loss against Auburn. Maybe he can make up some ground after that fact. He was probably, you know, the front runner early in the season before that loss to Auburn. So maybe he's playable, but I'm looking more toward a guy like Caleb Williams. He's PFF's highest graded uh, college quarterback so far in 2021. He does have, um, you know, the added element with his legs that is so effective, especially at the college football level. Eight explosive rushing plays so far this season. He's forced to miss tackle on 50% of his rushing attempts. So I think from that perspective, uh, given where Oklahoma is right now, you know, we looked at the, like the college football playoff committee has them as the eighth overall team. I don't think they're going to end up finishing there. So I do think the books are probably giving us a little bit of break on both their national championship odds and Caleb Williams probably win uh, the Heisman. So at plus 700, 12.5% break even percentage. I can definitely see uh, maybe a little bit of a sprinkle on him, but I'm not def- I'm not like unit size betting it or anything like that. I just think it's a, you know, a fun little play that I do think could probably get home here. Now, you mentioned the PFF grade for Caleb Williams, and I think that's one thing that's unique about PFF is that, like, for college football, there are so many teams and so many players, it's hard to, like, have a legit, like, player-based model because, like, we all have time constraints unless we're, like, just betting one conference. Do you feel like that gives you a kind of unique position to be in where you have that player level data as far as betting college football? Yeah, I, def- I, I do definitely think it does help. I think it definitely helps strengthen our green line model, um, but just understanding both how well he is performing and then what his loss is actually going to be and what it should be against the spread against the spread, I think are two main things that we can do a lot better than any sort of publicly available data. And of course, you know, it's not me going in grading every single one of these players. A lot of, we have a lot of analysts trained uh, and, you know, to be without bias and give accurate uh, assessment of how these players actually perform. So actually using those in the model, we found to be uh, quite effective. And I do think it gives PFF in general, just a leg up on, you know, a lot of the other publicly available uh, information. I know other people kind of try and build some of those player level grades, but um, I still think that's folding in some of the stats, EPA based things that we aren't necessarily taking into account when we're just doing it based on PFF grading. And I know there are a lot so, of people who use PFF grades in their NFL models too. Yep. 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 I think, yeah, I do. Yep. I do know that some of the, you know, the bigger, especially public facing betters do fold in um, some PFF level stuff into their NFL equation. So um, it's definitely being utilized. We have done the majority of work for you um, <laughs> already with PFF Greenline, if you want to check that out. But I do think, um, you know, it's interesting and you can even get a lot of that data if you have a PFF Elite subscription. So if you want to do some of the modeling yourself, take a slightly different approach. Uh, we definitely are open to kind of, you know, allowing people to get that sort of information and data for their own betting purposes. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I use PFF NFL cover grades a lot. Yeah. And uh, it's an important part of my analysis because even if I'm watching a game, I can't I can't even actually see what the coverage is like on most right. plays, right? right? So so you really need someone else to do that. And then the other thing, not not that I want to go on a commercial about your company, but <laughs> I will anyways. Like I'm actually finding some of the data files to be incredibly useful. 
So, you know, there's one data file you can just download that has all uh, pass coverage stats right. for every player in the NFL. And that is, I haven't even started completely using that, but you can, you can kind of do this. Uh, you know, we talk about yards per route for receivers, but you can actually do that for cover guys now too, right. Right. Um, which is, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyway. I definitely appreciate that. We are trying to, you know, allow the data sources to be used by people, but yeah, it's, um, it's, and, yeah. and time, it's time is a big thing, right? So it's like, I'm not doing all the grading or anything, but I use the data, of course, and it's, you know, available for everyone else too. So. And Absolutely. I used the data heavily for the NFL draft stuff last year. Like it's been, yeah. it's been a help. I can, I can guarantee that and be in vouch for its effectiveness as well. Let's talk about some games here. Starting off with uh, the Big Ten, Michigan at Penn State. This is a pick 'em right now. Uh, minus one ten on both sides and the money line total is forty eight and a half. And Penn State is tough because they had a dip. Sean Clifford is banged up. Seems like he might be a bit healthier right now. So for you, Ben, are you downplaying what Penn State did? in October be due to Clifford's health, or do you think that it's worthwhile to, to fold that in and maybe be skeptical what we see in the past couple games? Yeah. I mean, I honestly think it's a little bit baked into the betting market already. Like I think there's almost this expectation that they would have won against Iowa. If, if Sean Clifford stays in the game, I actually do think that's accurate. Uh, you know, the marathon against Illinois as well. Mm -hmm. I definitely think his injury impacted him in that performance, uh, but they looked, you know, decently well against Ohio State. I think they played better than expected. Definitely covered. Um, I think from that perspective, I I think their lull is almost overbaked into the market a little bit, and people might have them almost a little bit higher in their power rankings uh, because there's an obvious reason for why they didn't play really well, right? So I think maybe fading that a little bit uh, is the correct approach in this matchup. Um, I, I, lean toward, I lean toward Michigan a little bit. I do think Cade McNamara um, is probably a I don't know I guess if he's a better quarterback I think based on PFF grade it's basically uh Sean Clifford and him are kind of right next to each other uh Michigan has the better rushing attack I do think Penn State has the better players on the outside both in coverage and at the wide receiver position so if they win outside um that's going to be how Penn State wins this game but I think Michigan has uh the strength against the defense line specifically with the pass rush so I think they're going to be able to force enough pressure on Sean Clifford to make him uncomfortable and saying that I think they're going to cover uh and it's going to be a little late hopefully they win by a field goal so that's kind of how I see this game playing I'm interested to hear uh your thoughts on how you expect this Michigan Penn State game to go yeah I'm completely biased about this obviously living here in Ann Arbor and and uh I consider like Michigan is the one team I will root for that 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 I actually have to treat as a business, you know, as my job to, to kind of cover them and try in some way to look at it from uh, uh, an unbiased perspective, which which is clearly impossible. I did bet Michigan uh, plus one and a half at FanDuel. I, I don't particularly like it, but I think that's some of my bias going in. I don't I mean, has the road team won in the series? I guess I guess Penn State won last year, yeah. but. In normal circumstances, uh, things have not gone well in Happy Valley. I mean, they came pretty close when Shea Patterson was the quarterback and had some fluky things go on. Um, but I did like the bet. My numbers liked it. Uh, I knew I, – I think the market – the market is moving that way. I think it will continue to move that way as well. So uh, – and, and since you agree, Ben, I'm, I'm just going with it there. <laughs> and you and the rest of the market, if they agree with me, I'm going to – I'm going to – I'm just going to be happy with what I got. Oh, yeah. oh, and actually what I think is interesting is what you mentioned about the quarterbacks. Like I actually hadn't thought about comparing McNamara and Clifford, but I, I, I think at this point, yeah, they're about the same. Right. Right. Like I don't think Clifford's that great. Uh, he kind of got off to a pretty good start this year heading into that Iowa game. Um, and then the numbers from the Illinois game just kind of have destroyed Penn State's passing numbers. Right. And, right. and you know, McNamara's got a ceiling. So I don't think I don't think he's going to lead Michigan to where they want to be without some kind of good fortune this season. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they're yeah, they're, they're fine quarterbacks, but I don't think either of them really can carry a program. Yeah, I think that uh, it, it makes sense. And it's an interesting game here for sure. Ben, you said that you think Michigan can pull this game out late. Do you have enough conviction in that to to lay to take the money line at minus one ten, or is that is it a stay away efficient market for you? Uh, I actually I am going to get a little bit on uh, Michigan's money line for sure at minus okay. one ten. I did miss you know 
better a better number like Ed said, but um, I think it's the spot that I'm definitely going to be playing. Probably also monitoring a little bit in game. Um, yeah. If if Michigan gets down a little bit early, I do expect to uh, hopefully load up on you know plus three and a half or something like that across a key number as well. Is live betting a, a key part of your process, or are you more so locking stuff in before the game? Um, I actually am making it much more uh, a part of my process. So I do think, you know, waiting and having that understanding of key numbers uh, is one of the best ways to kind of learn more about uh, sports betting in general, you know, watching the game, having a second screen up where you're kind of following along with that spread and total and understanding, you know, like what plays are swinging the spread and total in certain directions, I think is a really good way to understand how the market is pricing in certain situations. And I think, you know, it is a really difficult problem to solve. The only models that we that are really available are at books and sports books right now, right? There's no publicly facing uh, live betting model that's going to really give you enough information to probably beat the spread or total. So um, I think if you don't have a sports betting model, that is the best area to attack. And I think uh, right now, especially, it's probably uh, the least efficient market that you can find from a sports betting perspective just wish there wasn't the like 40 second delay that would make right. things a lot easier <laughs> life would be a lot easier then uh seeing like players running the field like via the next gen stats tracking i'm like huh why is the long snapper on the field that's kind of weird they're on the 30 yard line something <laughs> happened definitely uh, a factor for me let's move now to oklahoma at baylor oklahoma here five and a half point favorite total is 62 and a half we talked about caleb williams before and how pff is liking what they're seeing so far so we've seen a good sample of Oklahoma yep. with Caleb Williams. What is their ceiling to you with Williams instilled now as a quarterback? Yeah, I mean, so they're, they're second overall in EPA per play, uh, the number one team if you include only Power 5 schools. So I would say, you know, that's pretty close to their ceiling, right? Second or third best offense in college football right now. I think, you know, maybe Alabama outside of that. I do think it's Oklahoma, right? And I think they have... Um, you know, a lot of the pieces in place to be a top two or three offense at the college football level. And that's uh, something that, you know, PFF in general, we not necessarily overvalue offense, but we definitely lean heavily in that direction. So uh, it's just a spot where we're going to like and get on board with. And I think, you know, I think they are, you know, dark horse uh, uh, college football playoff contenders right now. And I think with the break that, you know, the college football playoff committee is giving us, with eighth overall, they are definitely uh, my selection right now, given their odds. Yeah, they are minus 174 to make the college football playoff right now over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Right. So oh. clearly FanDuel is viewing things similarly, where <laughs> they think, right. you know, they've got a good road here. That yeah, seems that's, pretty that's short. A, that's an indictment of the conference. Right. Right. <laughs> right. That's, that's not like <laughs> lifting up Oklahoma. That's an indictment of the conference. It, it feels like that number is pretty short. Is that right. is that still long enough where you consider betting it or is this properly accounted for the stuff you just discussed? i think that's actually pretty p- confidently uh accounting for where we are at we have we have oklahoma at 71 percent to make the college football playoffs so i okay. think it's uh you know relatively close but it's i'd probably still stay away i'd probably feel better yeah. about you know betting them on the spread especially if they get to the college football playoffs so ben i did want to ask you i mean we talked about caleb williams in the heisman part of the show you know he he hasn't played a significant fraction of the season so I, I don't know. Can a can a guy win the Heisman playing half the year? You know, I mean, six games, seven games. I mean, what what is he go, what, what is he going to have by the time they're they're voting? Yeah, he will have. Uh, what is it? He's played seven, so he'll be up to ten basically. Oh, he'll um, be up to ten. Okay, that's yeah. So, and that's and that's the that's really tricky. Terrible. Yeah, that's the really tricky thing about modeling. You know, like the Heisman Trophy and MVP is there's so much human bias baked in, right? right. And there's so many things where we don't necessarily know how. Uh, you know, like the committee and everyone else is going to even handle it this year. You can fold in some prior year history, but uh, it seems like every year is kind of its own unique outcome. So it is it is difficult to kind of model it from that perspective. And that that is a very good point to be uh, maybe more hesitant about his chances in general. And I think it's a unique year, similar to last year, too, honestly, where like you saw a wide receiver win. Like that's right. kind of strange, but like because it's pretty wide open, you get more leeway, I would guess, in terms of having a guy who starts 10 games, whatever it may be. And in getting them over that hump, especially if they continue to do what they've done. I know that Kansas game is still kind of weird, but like they've started to actually get some like convincing wins. Right. So what do you see with this game, Ben? Uh, five and a half point spread, 62 and a half point total. Are you seeing any value there? What's your read on this game? Um, I don't have a ton of value on the spread. Um, 
it's it's tough. I would probably lean a little bit toward Oklahoma. I don't really show quite enough value to basically bet it, so I'm not going to you know say or recommend that play. I don't mind the under, um, but I think it's more of a spot where you could look at uh, playing like Baylor's under team total. I think it's probably going to, you know, once they release that market, 13 and a half, 14 in the first half, uh, right around 28 in the second half. That would be the spot that I'd probably target in this game. I just think you know, Baylor's hoping to keep this game low scoring. If they are successful defensively doing that, um, it's going to be a little bit more choppy than what we probably project. So we'll see. We, you know, we, we obviously, you know, have uh, Oklahoma's defense. That's okay. Basically. I think they have, you know, a really good pass rush unit. Their coverage unit has been, uh, you know, one of the, one of the worst coverage units in, in college football so far, but I think if they can get enough pressure on Jerry Bohannon, uh, this game is probably going to finish well short of that 62 and a half point total. Right. And that's a huge disappointment for an Oklahoma defense that brought a ton of guys back. Right. right. And I remember talking to Phil Steele this preseason talking about how he loved the talent coming back on that unit. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's been, yeah, they're 83rd in the country and our opponent adjusted coverage grade. Uh, so they've been, you know, heavily maintained by that pass rush unit. We have the pass rush unit as a top five unit, you know, Nick bon- Bonito, 37 pressures so far this year. I think that's ninth among players in the power five conference. So he has the sixth best pass rush grade, but um, if they're not successful getting home against, you know, Baylor offense, that is pretty good at pass blocking. Uh, that's, it's going to be a long game for Oklahoma. So we'll see if, I think that's kind of the matchup that Oklahoma needs to win uh, in order to cover the five and a half point spread. And I'm not overly confident they're going to, that they're going to be able to do it. Okay, so efficient awesome. lines there. Let's move now to NC State at Wake Forest. Wake Forest here, two and a half point favor, and the total is 66 and a half. And a really fun matchup here with Wake Forest offense versus NC State's defense. They both been playing pretty well. So who do you see holding the edge here uh, for Wake Forest's offense versus NC State's defense? Yeah, definitely. I, and I, I agree with you, right? NC State, second best defense in the ACC, according to what we're looking at. Uh, you know, Shaheem Battle has really found it in his junior season. Uh, PFF coverage grade of 78, ranks 24th among Power 5 cornerbacks. Uh, you know, and Tyler Baker Williams as well, kind of right along similar with that. Are they able to slow down A.T. Perry, Jakari Robertson? Um I it's it's a tough one to model. I don't actually have, you know, a huge lean on the spreader total in this game. Um, I am intrigued by it quite a bit. I have bet some NC State unders previously in the season hasn't worked out too well for me. Um, so I, if I was leaning in one direction, I would go for Wake Forest um, just based on how, you know, efficient Sam Hartman has been offensively, how good their pass pass route unit or, you know, the wide receiver unit is. Um, and I just don't know if, you know, Devin Leary and that NC State offense is going to be able to keep pace. But I think I think it could be a little bit of a struggle to start. Definitely, like you said, NC State uh, defensively is looking like one of the better units in the country. So we'll see. It is it is definitely an intriguing matchup, but I unfortunately don't really have a strong lean on any one of the game spreads or totals. Now, you mentioned that PFF does skew towards offense, which you should because defense is less sticky and stuff like that. Does that alter the way you view these matchups where it is an outlier offense facing an outlier defense are you more skeptical of when it may show value in the off uh, the powerful offense in that spot or do you have trust that you know the numbers are properly accounting for the variance in defense and bet it anyway yeah i usually i would lean toward the latter i do have you know more confidence that the numbers are taking into account the correct things from both the offense and defensive side i would lean more toward you know a more efficient offense uh winning and dictated against a really strong defense that doesn't play out in every single scenario, but I think it has, you know, enough historically based on our modeling to probably be the correct approach going forward. Yep. I think that's uh that's the proper way to view things there. Okay. So we got a whole lot of games on the board this week, Ben, any place else you are seeing value for week number 11. Yeah, definitely. I like Miami minus 2.5 taking on Florida state rival rivalry game could get kind of crazy. Um, I've liked what Tyler Van Dyke has put forth three solid PFF passing great performances. He is a little bit of that high variance quarterback, but I think him Charleston Rambeau, I think they're going to do enough for Miami to win by at least a field goal, if not more. So I definitely like that one a little more, you know, down and dirty way down the barrel plays. I do like old dominion plus 220. It's a really low total 47 and a half points uh, against Florida Atlantic sitting right below that key number seven that we're kind of looking for. So I do think it's a spot where me personally, I'm trying to get more comfortable kind of betting some of those uh, higher up money lines, especially in these really low total games. So I do like old dominion on uh, the Perry. I do think he's going to be able to get it done enough times. Um, or I guess they're going to be able to slow down the Co- Perry enough times to uh, potentially win this game outright. So I like that one quite a bit. And then last one, I was on air force quite a bit last week against army. 
Uh, kind of a sloppy di- game. Didn't quite get home, but I am going back to the well with this one. I do like them. Minus two and a half against Colorado State. Um, obviously, they you know have 85% or so uh, rush percentage based on their overall offensive plays. Um, I just think they're going to be able to probably move the ball well, and I think this could be a little bit of a blow for Air Force. So I like those three games quite a bit here. I think the money lines and low total games make sense because it's just more variance and right. like you're letting yourself up for more volatility plus 220 is a good number there so i think that does make sense that is ben brown make sure you check him out on twitter at pff underscore ben brown and check out uh the uh the pff betting podcast as well ben we appreciate the time good luck to you this week both with college football and the nfl and hopefully we can get you on here once again soon yeah thank you guys so much covering the future Big thank you once again to Ben Brown for swinging by and breaking down his thoughts on week 11 across college football. Find Ben on Twitter at PFF underscore Ben Brown and check out the PFF betting podcast. Ed, we touched on one of the big games in the Big Ten this week. That's Michigan at Penn State. Other one is Ohio State versus Purdue. What are you seeing in this game? Yeah, you know, it, it was interesting. So last week for my free email newsletter, which you can sign up for at thepowerrank.com, I uh, talked about Ohio State and Nebraska talked about how i liked over 63 and a half and uh the market's closed at 67 and a half like it kind of fluttered around 63 64 got away all got so despite four line four points of closing line value uh you know the game went under ohio state seemed somewhat lackluster in a in a nine point win at nebraska um but despite the loss i mean i still see value in ohio state as an over team the offense ranks third in the nation in my justice success rate. And here's the most remarkable thing about the offense, right? We know Garrett Wilson. We know Chris Olave. They're considered NFL draft picks. Their leading receiver is actually Jackson Smith Najiba. He's actually the leader in both yards and yards per route. And he had a mind boggling 240 yards on 15 receptions against Nebraska. So the offense is good. There are three weapons uh, that CJ Stroud can go to. Uh, I still, you know, they didn't have the best game at Nebraska, but I think they'll have a good game here. As I talked about last week, uh, Purdue's defense is pretty solid. They rank 16th in my adjusted success rate. Uh, but I do think Ohio State's a more talented team. And I think that does matter. And in the horseshoe, I think Ohio State is going to score some points. On defense, you know, Ohio State's defense is, is is not great, and they particularly they struggle against the pass. They're 50th when I look at adjusted passing success rate. And Purdue wide receiver David Bell has, has had uh, average 3.5 yards per route. Um, Aiden O'Connell has been pretty good, and I expect Purdue to get some points as well. So my model predicts 68.5 points uh, around there. I think that's a little bit high, but I do think there is value in over 61.5. Uh, so that is what I like for this week. You were talking about the receivers for Ohio State. Ryan McChrystal was tweeting about them today. Uh, I happened to notice that when you were earlier on, yeah. and he was saying that might have to compare them to the Alabama guys like Jerry Judy, uh, you know, right. Devontae Smith, Henry Ruggs, when they had that trio. Also, they had Jalen Waddle at the time, like when they had those three guys, because uh, Wilson and Olave are getting like first round NFL draft buzz, but as you mentioned, like. It's not just them. So just them. that's tough when you got to shut down three legit right. guys and you got a good quarterback slinging it too. Right. Well, and you have Travion Henderson breaking off big runs too. So uh, yeah, there's, I mean, that, that offense is really good, which yeah. is a problem for Michigan, but talk we talked about, about them with Ryan, I think like pretty early on, it was, I think it might've been after the Oregon loss potentially. And he was talking about how like he thought they might, go pretty nuts in the second half we've seen that so far so we'll yep. see what ohio state can do uh against purdue for this week again the total 61 and a half over at FanDuel sportsbook right now for mine on the nfl side i want to go uh with an opposite approach to what i've had recently i've had a couple times where i've gotten burned by taking the points on big numbers uh one of them i still feel like i stubbornly should have won but you know whatever anyway we're gonna lay the points this week that's with the cardinals against the panthers at minus 10 and a half and a lot of this comes down to injuries the panthers are likely to start pj walker at quarterback with sam darnold being banged up and we've gotten to see walker a bit in the nfl and i actually do you think he would be a downgrade even with how bad Darnold has been this year? Walker had negative 0.28 passing net expected points per dropback on his 60 dropbacks last year. 
got a full start in there, had some relief of Teddy Bridgewater as well. So negative 0.28 there. This year, he's at negative 0.66. He has completed three of 15 passes, which is not ideal. I'm willing to give him leeway on this year because those were all in relief, didn't get to start, didn't get the, the first team reps. But seeing him struggle last year, too, when he did get a start, did get those first team reps, that's more concerning. The two years combined with the car, uh, with the Panthers, Walker's at negative 0.36, uh, passing that expected points per drop back, whereas Darnold is at negative 0.06. So Darnold, real bad. P.J. Walker has been even worse. But it's not just that. It's also that they've lost their starting center and their starting left tackle to injuries. They're both on IR right now. So you're giving me a backup quarterback, backup center, backup left tackle. Not ideal. On the Cardinals side, Kyler Murray is is not guaranteed to go. Uh, like reading the, the words from Cliff Kingsbury, there's still a chance that he can't go this week. It sounded like he was close last week, so I'm fine like kind of operating under the assumption that he will go. But if he doesn't, like Colt McCoy got the job done last week, didn't have DeAndre Hopkins there, might have him this time around. So right now my numbers have the Cardinals here by 14. If I put in a downgrade, assuming for that Kyler sits, it does go down to 9.7. So that'd be assuming that there is a 0% chance Kyler plays. We're recording on Wednesday. I think there is more than a 0% chance. So I think that that's pretty fair. And that's without making an adjustment for Darnold to PJ Walker, because my numbers already view this offense as being trash. So it's hard to make trash trashier <laughs> and justify it when we're usually oh, looking at regression towards the mean, you know, I think it's fair to leave them where they're at. So I think even here with some things left undecided, I am good laying the 10 and a half and riding with the Cardinals for this week. Ed, what are your numbers saying here? Panthers versus Cardinals. Yeah, I mean, I have Arizona by about eight and a half. Um, it, it's interesting with the quarterback adjustments because I've been thinking about this in terms of other games. You know, the market's made a pretty big adjustment for Mike White before that Cincinnati game. Uh, I forget what the margin is, but they said the Jets were significantly worse. He went out, he played really well. And then uh, it's been two weeks in a row that that New Orleans hasn't had Jameis Winston. Trevor Simeon started. And with zero adjustments, my number has been right on the market. So it doesn't really make sense to me, but that's what the market's saying right now. Uh, I, I, I mean, it, it seems like there should be a drop off from Jameis to Trevor Simeon. Not an so, Touchdown what? Trevor's the best quarterback in football, Ed. What do you, what do you say? Northwestern grad Trevor Simeon is the best quarterback in football. No bias. No bias. No bias at all. So, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, Darnold's been bad. I mean, maybe that's similar to Zach Wilson going to the yep. backup there. Uh, he he started every game, right? Yes, he's left yeah. early twice. And is uh, he, he, no, three times, sorry. And is because, he, def is so he, he definitely out with the Yeah. He broke I'm it, so sure there's no way he's playing. Correct. Okay. Uh, the market moved to half point. It was 10, and it came off a key number of 10, so like maybe that half point's worth more. But it did move a bit with the Darnold shoulder news. But either way, I think that this one is favorable towards the Cardinals regardless. So I think that's a 10 and a half, very fair number that I'm willing to lay with them for right now. We'll talk more NFL with Brandon Gadula later on today in our second episode of covering the spread both on this Wednesday. So make sure you are subscribed to get that to covering the spread wherever you get your podcast. Also, once again, a big thank you to Ben Brown for swinging by breaking down his thoughts on college football betting, the Heisman and more find Ben on Twitter at PFF underscore Ben Brown and check out the PFF betting podcast as well ed what is going on for you this week over at the power rank i had tony miller who's the director of the sports book at the golden nugget on the football analytics show as with all bookmakers it was an excellent conversation really interested in his process and and how he makes numbers how he adjusts to the market mm -hmm. how he is sometimes off market and we talked about two nfl games and in, in which that was the case uh tony's kind of old school so that was pretty interesting as well and uh yeah so check that out wherever you get podcasts uh the football analytics show and then uh i'm writing my email newsletter uh you can get that at thepowerrank.com and then i also started posting college basketball predictions for members this week so if that's something you're interested you can in you can check that out at thepowerrank.net so you can learn more about becoming a member
So the powerrank.net for the college basketball stuff, the powerrank.com to sign up for the email newsletter and find Ed on Twitter at the power rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel podcast network at FanDuel podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. We'll talk to you once again later on to get you set for NFL week number 10. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network. What's up guys. This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, Please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.